This video is part of a series, and the series is on the topic of romance. And the first video in the series, and I'll put a link in the description, was why did I not experience romance or do dating for 39 years of my life? And then the second video was on, well, why did I start? And then since then, what I've been doing is romantic informational interviews. And that's what this video is about. Now, what's interesting is that one or two people who I interviewed and then a few people who I didn't said that maybe I was over intellectualizing the process of romance and that I probably shouldn't do the informational interviews. And I think there's a lot of depth in that because usually you don't want to do, 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 you know, use your brain for everything. You want to just immerse yourself in the emotion. At the same time, I kind of feel like there are moments where using your brain can deeply enhance the experience. And one example is uh, when I go walking. You know, when I go walking, I use a little bit of science and I try to identify all the little creatures and trees and plants and insects along the way. And this really deepens my connection to nature. It makes the walk so much more beautiful and I feel connected to the entire ecosystem. So, you know, for me, I found these informational interviews to really you know, again, deepened my connection um, to romance. Uh, they were so meaningful. Uh, and, and just being able to connect with people who genuinely care about me added, I think, so much to my life. And it allowed me to puncture through small talk with some people who I've known for a long time. I, I strongly recommend everybody to actually do something similar just because it allows you to connect with people uh, in a unique way. As a very quick overview, I interviewed uh, 23 people and 9 of them had pronouns of he, 12 of them had pronouns of she, and 2 of them had pronouns of they. And the age ranges went from mid-20s all the way up to mid-90s. And on average, they were clustered uh, you know, in their 30s. The interviews lasted anywhere from 1 hour to like, one interview was like 5 hours long. Uh, and on average, people spent one and a half hours. And again, it's such a gift because in this day and age, people are so busy, understandably. So to take that time out uh, to give me wisdom uh, was such a beautiful, beautiful moment. So now the next question is, um, you know, I asked them, why is it that they are in romantic relationships? What's the point? What's the purpose? What do you get from it? What do you give from it? And the first group of answers was sex and intimacy. People were in romantic relationships because they needed physical intimacy, but also emotional intimacy. Some people liked fun. Um, you know, one person said men desire basic things. Uh, they want to be fed, they want to be fucked by as many girls as possible, and they want their egos stroked. Uh, one person said that sex on a regular basis without putting in too much work but also, you know, what was important to him were the other touches and hugs and closeness and the idea that sex with someone who you love is euphoric. And again, I should say that, like, these are categories, but no one was contained within a category. You know, people said many different things. So, for example, this person also talked about how important having a family is. So, so you know, people are complex. There are many reasons why they enter into relationships. He also said that it gave him a sense of peace, and a few other people also said that, that uh, relationships, the reason they're in it, because it brings them peace and calmness, it eases tensions, it quiets one's minds, and lets a stressful day fade away. A lot of people said companionship and support, it allows them to avoid loneliness and get through difficulties in this world, which is a tough world. Um, someone's always on your side to help you through this journey and that allows you to you know, grow together uh, through the different stages of life and uncover all sorts of things uh, that may be in your way. They also said life is more interesting with another person and several people talked about deep sharing. You can share the good but you can also share the bad of what you're going through. You can share the beauty of nature and, and, and want nothing in return, and you can share your vulnerabilities. A few people talked about love, to be loved and to give love to other people, to be cared and to be able to care for another person. 
One person talked about the idea of how loving another person allowed her to love humanity and deepen her connection with humanity, which I found fascinating. So I asked, how, how is that possible? And she explained that you know, if your partner deeply loves the universe, you're able to absorb those vibes and also learn to love the universe as well. Some people talked about the reason they enter into relationships is because they really wanted family and children. A group of people talked about that relationships allowed them to grow and it motivated them to achieve goals. Uh, they allowed them to push out of their comfort zone and understand what their strengths and weaknesses were, explore new things. You know, one person talked about that it deepened her spirituality and connection with humanity and the universe. And another person said that it allowed them to deepen their self-confidence and their faith in themselves. Uh, one person uh, it was interesting, like he had gotten out of uh, a relationship, it was a breakup, and his process of healing was to devote himself to a worthy cause. And he said that this worthy cause was very difficult to try to achieve. And the urges of wanting to be in a relationship or sexual urges, these are very strong motivators. So if you can somehow channel them, he said, if you can sort of turn them into a horse that tugs your chariot in the direction that you want to go in, then it can help you achieve great things. So he said that, he would only enter into a romantic relationship again after he achieved this dream of his. And so for like two, three years, he worked singularly on this, on this dream and used this urge of relationships to push that dream and advance it, which I thought was really interesting. You know, one person talked about the idea that their music got deeper because both of them were able to collaborate on musical things. Now, another group of people talked about the reason why they entered into a romantic relationship was duty. Duty to society, to parents, to tradition. And these were all people who were born in India many, many decades ago. And, uh, and another series of responses, these were not during this particular interview process, but when I go to India and I tell some of my relatives that I don't know if I'll marry or not, they would say, look, you know, marriage is part of the duty, it, like your duty to nature getting married and producing children, they would ask me, well, who's going to take care of you when you get older? And who's going to take care of your mother? Because the traditional Indian viewpoint is that your parents will stay with the eldest child, and I guess, you know, the wife has to take care of the parents. That's how the system is. Uh, they also said, you know, are you going to deprive your mother of, of grandchildren? So these are also motivating factors that, that some people use to get into relationships. The next question I had are like, what are the different types of romantic relationships? What are the different models out there? And I was fortunate enough to talk to people who have, you know, relationship styles that range from monogamy to polyamory. So within monogamy, there are many different variants and one of them are arranged marriages. And so I talked to four people and arranged marriages, um, these were all people who were born and raised in India. So the first person, uh, she said she was forced to marry because, you know, she had to obey her parents. And marriage was a series of adjustments and compromises. And initially she and her husband were just friends because he was really focused on his career. And then as time went by, they slowly liked each other and eventually love blossomed. And so this was like a, a successful arranged marriage situation. And the husband, what he said, the reason why he did marriage was because it was based on a commitment that his father had made. And, you know, before that commitment, he had never even seen his, his wife-to-be. So for him, marriage was a duty, and he left everything on God, uh, because from his perspective, marriage is set in heaven. So the philosophy, I think, of arranged marriages is that the true beauty of a relationship is not in the transient lust, but the ideology that really a deep relationship filled with love is a slow building process of experiences through formative events such as raising a family together um, while you have mutual trust. And people who are advocates of arranged marriage will say that there are high rates of failure in both arranged marriages as there are in loved marriages. And at the end of the day, it's not really about the model as much as it is about the two individuals and their willingness to make a relationship work. 
Uh, on the other hand, what makes this theoretical ideal difficult to realize is that people really need to understand that this is a slow building process where the bond is being made. And, and if you look at some of the media in India, the, the novels, the, the movies, which is the same in the U.S., it really does focus on those first stages of romance, making unreasonable expectations of in the arranged marriage situation. I think much more significantly is that India is a male-dominated society, especially back then. Maybe things are changing now. And what this really meant is that the woman had to sacrifice. She was in the relationship. The woman is typically the one who sacrifices, who compromises. This is something I've seen firsthand um, in many places. Okay, so the other type of relationship within monogamy is the saving yourself model. And in this model, you wait until marriage to have this really formative and deep experience of having sex. And, you know, the idea here is that marriage is a really beautiful process that's a union of, of the physical, the mental, the spiritual. And commitment itself is really a beautiful process. And this is interesting because it contrasts with the next model, which is the 90-day serial monogamy model. Now, this I know this person, so I asked him many questions. So this is like a case study almost. So from his point of view, long-term monogamous relationships like marriages uh, is against nature. And what he told me was that lions and lionesses are you know, intensely passionate for a short duration of time, and then that relationship ends, and they're reabsorbed back into the pride. And this is what you know, he said, that monkeys also do it, and gorillas, and horses, and most animals do this. And so from his point of view, this is what is natural. And when you deny your urges and your sexuality, such as being stuck in a long-term monogamous relationship, it leads to perversions. And that's why he says there's a high divorce rate and, and lots of cheating. Um, interestingly, he's also not a fan of polyamory because for him, he wants to be in a short duration relationship, but when he's in it, he wants to be like strongly attached and singularly focused on that partner. So, you know, and also he said that, you know, he's experienced many one night stands and those are fun in the moment. However, they don't have the depth that a 90 day relationship would have uh, because in that 90 days you get to know the person. So in his, you know, ideal situation, uh, it's a short duration of monogamy that lasts for 90 days. And I'm like, well, why 90 days? And his response was that in those 90 days, that's the first phase of infatuation. After and during that first phase, it's intensely sexual and fun and your partner, she'll give you everything. But after that 90 days, that's when the commitment comes in. And then, you know, he said that, you know, she will test you and it requires a lot of work and the quality goes down. And the only reason why anyone should go into that phase is if they want to give birth to a child, um, at which point, um, you know, the, the partners will not give each other their best qualities and instead focus it on the child. So then I asked, well, you know, why is sex so important for you? And his response was that sex is the root of all life and everything comes from there and the entire universe is because of sex and so from his viewpoint the there's a duality in the universe this male and female energy um, and sex allows him to tap into that duality and therefore deepen his meditative practice and for him infatuation is not a selfish thing because it allows you to completely share and immerse yourself in one another. And when you're infatuated, when you're infatuated, you are, you're channeling love with one another. So then I asked, well, okay, you know, if you have to end a relationship in 90 days, don't you have any lingering attachment? And he says, you know, sometimes he does. But those lingering attachments are a way for him to explore what his weaknesses are what allows him or what perturbs him, and it gives him an opportunity to learn from it and, and, and figure out what his dependencies are and then grow from there. And, and when he's feeling kind of in that funk after a 90-day relationship has ended, he remembers that he was happy before it, um, and then he laughs and, and the cycle breaks. Um, and so you know, he talks about that he cherishes uh, these moments when he remembers back. And, and once it's gone, he's okay with it. So you cherish it while it's there, and then you don't have attachment to it. 
Uh, and so his final statement was that you have to be dispassionate to pain and pleasure, and after enough time, um, I guess that attachment and selfishness disappears. Another person, an interesting model, uh, so he, you know, this person does long-term uh, monogamous relationships, but for him, like the ideal duration um, are, you know, every week he would like to spend three days, really like the weekend, focused on his partner, uh, but then the next four days in his ideal world would be completely removed in a way from his partner so he could entirely focus on his work because his work is really important to, to what he does. Now the next type of relationships are hooking up and a whole bunch of people have tried hooking up and this ranges from one night stands to friends with benefits. Um, you know, a lot of these people said that like and, and this included even people who are really, really into sex, that like hooking up can be fun in the moment, but overall, most people didn't find it to be satisfying. And for them, the deepest experience came when they had emotional connections with the people. Uh, and this, you know, one person, you know, she said that this might be also because why, you know, when you're hooking up, the, the person's really just focusing on their pleasure. And so you don't get that emotional connection, although, you know, some experiences of hooking up can be good. Um, and again, this was kind of surprising to me too, because one person talked about one night stands or threesomes, one night stands, there was a foursome, you know, three, three women and one man. So you'd think that that would be a culminative, amazing experience. But again, for him, he said that it was fun, but really at the end of the day, it was if you had an emotional bond with something, someone that made the deeper memory. Um, and and was a, it was a deeper experience. One person also said that you know she tried for a while to to have relationships that were just focused on sex and exploring her senses, but she found that to sustain a sex only model, she had to detach, and in her experience, it led to more emptiness. So then this brings us to an interesting viewpoint. So this is not specifically a relationship model as it is a way to sort of look at and frame relationships. And so one person who I interviewed practiced relationship anarchy. And this is the idea that you first, before going into a relationship, you first eliminate pre-existing rules and you customize your own boundaries. Because, you know, there can be many different types of gradients and many different types of relationships, and there isn't specifically one optimal model that works for everyone. So relationship anarchy doesn't say don't do monogamy. You could construct a relationship that's standard monog uh, monogamy. It just says, before you start, think about what's important, what your needs are, what your desires are, and how to address that. Similarly, you know, it says that breakups can be customized, so it doesn't always have to be a complete and absolute break. Um, once your romance falls apart, you can still have a deep connection with them, or, or not, if they're a toxic person. But the idea here is that you can customize. And, you know, I also had uh, a really good opportunity to join a relationship anarchy support group, and they're really friendly and open, and they talked about a lot of the same things that you may talk about in a monogamous sort of support group. Um, one of the things that was novel was that they talked about how it's sometimes difficult in a relationship anarchy framework to figure out what path to take because it's not a, there's no pre-made path, there are no pre-made expectations, you have to build it from scratch. And so they talked about what kind of guidelines or scripts can they use that can allow them to try different tri types of frameworks. The next relationship model that I explored or talked to people about was polyamory. It was really cool was that I discovered that there were many people who actually practice it in my interview group. So I had eight people who have tried polyamory and then six people who are still doing it. Now as just general information, the idea of polyamory is that you have multiple romantic partners that you're simultaneously interacting with. And one of the ideas is that just as you can love many family members, the idea in polyamory is that you can love many romantic partners. And there's no limit to how many people you can love. Although they did say that, you know, one person, that there is a limit to the how much time you have. What's interesting about polyamory is that you can customize your experience with each of your romantic partners. So for example, one could just be a cuddle buddy. And so, you know, you don't have any sex, you just cuddle with the person. Another person could be a deep collaborative platonic relationship. And yet another person could be just for having sex. And potentially one other person 
could be for raising children. So the cool idea was that polyamory community does reinforce deep platonic relationships as well. One insight that someone gave me was that there are many different types of sexuality and attractions out there, like demisexual, sapiosexual, pansexual, bisexual, heterosexual, homosexual. And so what's interesting about polyamory is that it can, because you can sort of customize with each person what you experience, you can sometimes address the diversity of different sexualities and attractions out there. Some people who practice polyamory talked about uh, creating relationship manifestos to be able to articulate what's important and what their expectations are. I also asked a bunch of people, well, what are the negatives of a polyamorous relationship? And what you know, some people said was that you know you may not have a nesting partner. Um, they asked like, well, who is going to be there to love me when I'm old? And also, this wasn't the life I envisioned based on my parents' expectations. Um, they also, one of the people said that there there can be sometimes a lot of jealousy and stress in the polyamory community. Although other people said that sort of built into the polyamory relationship experience is the need to communicate and share uh, what your desires and expectations are and that is a structure that allows you to deal with jealousy and maybe more so than you would in a monogamous relationship. And one person shared the vocab word of compersion which means that instead of being jealous that your romantic partner may be interested in other people, you actually feel a genuine feeling of happiness that they are sexually attracted to other people and are doing romantic things with other people. The other sort of idea to think about is that polyamory often takes more time and mental bandwidth, especially if you want to do it uh, ethically. So for example, you have to figure out the structure of your relationship. What are your expectations? How do you communicate that? Whereas in monogamy, a lot of the structure is already understood and, and, and people already have a framework that they can go down. So it requires more mental bandwidth in that sense. You also have to have more mental bandwidth to understand all of your partner's emotional states. Whereas with monogamy, you have one person and so you can focus on and, and know sort of intuitively what exactly is it that, that may be bothering them. Um, you know, one, two people also said that for them, polyamory didn't work and one of the reasons why was for them was difficult to do it in a long-term fashion and that some of the constructs in society uh, didn't support it uh, so it was difficult. Now within polyamory there are many different types and one of those is called solo polyamory and this is where you are your own primary partner and you find beauty spending time just by yourself. Spending time by yourself is something precious that you like doing and you are the main source of your happiness. So that might mean that this is a personality type that likes to live by themselves uh, and you're not always available for people. Whereas in monogamy you may be sort of tied to the person 24-7. The other thing about being in a, in a solo polyamorous relationship is that you may not always even be romantically interacting with people on a daily basis. It may just be that once a month you may interact with one or, or different types of partners. And so you need to be okay with the ebbs and flows of having relationships. And, and by not having too many expectations on your partners, because you self-generate that, that happiness and contentment, you won't be hurt. The other type of polyamory is living together uh, with a primary partner. So you, there are two of you, you live together, but you also have an open relationship where you can go and see people. And I know this couple, so I asked many questions, so this is sort of like a, a case study as well. So in their journey, you know, they separately had tried monogamous relationships with different people, and in their life journeys, they found that to be very constrictive. And they had serious relationships when they were each individually in their high schools, and they had exploratory sexual relationships, and as often happens in, in early relationships, it ended in a lot of hurt and pain. And so they realized that they didn't want to feel shame for, for their big love, for having multiple uh, romantic partners. And they also really wanted to make sure that they didn't hurt other people. 
So when they decided to, when they met each other and they decided to form a relationship, they really wanted to make sure that it was a ethical, polyamorous relationship where, where they tried their best not to hurt one another. And so I asked them, like, you know, that must be really difficult if you're living together, but then you can see other people. I mean, how do you avoid hurting one another? And, and, and how do you balance all of that? And they talked about the idea that, again, like, you know, a lot of people think polyamorous relationships are sort of like a hedonistic thing. For some it may be, but again, if you want to do it ethically, you have to put in a lot of effort. And so they developed a bunch of tools that help them overcome some of the jealousy or other stresses that may come from being in a polyamorous relationship and living close together with one another. So the, the tool sets that they went over, which I think are really useful for monogamous relationships too, is first they had to really understand themselves, what their traumas are, what their body complexities are, what their desires and needs are. And then they had to establish radical honestly, honesty about their feelings, about their needs, of having big love, of wanting to see other people, and, and, and sort of resolving within themselves that this was not shameful or flawed. Uh, once they did that, they had to establish common language, how to communicate with one another where they really understood the nuances of what they were trying to communicate. And this was really important. And once they established that common language, they had to establish common expectations. What exactly was permissible? And then they had to make consensual agreements. And again, this meant that, you know, not, not that you could do every little thing that you desired for, but how do you respectfully explore what is it that you desire while honoring your partner? They talked about the idea that it was important to have support networks, about other, having other people in the poly community who have gone through similar things, share ideas and learn from them. And again, they had to put in a lot of time and effort into maintaining this relationship. So they had relationship check-ins every week. And these would last anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. They would start by appreciating one another and then talk about what happened in their past week and what kind of things bubbled up. They also had a relationship journal where they, they logged all the different things that they had been talking about as, as the years went by. And you know, one of the things that worked for their particular relationship style was, was if something came up, like jealousy or anger, they wouldn't always immediately share it. They would wait for the check-in, and that would allow them to ruminate on it and think about it. What was beneficial also for them as a tool was to create a long list of, of what they loved about each other and, and what they appreciated about themselves and what they brought to the relationship and what the relationship brought to them, what they loved about the unit at, together. And, and they felt it was important to, to highlight their shared values um, and, and, and their closely aligned purpose. And the main idea, again, was that willingness to, to commitmentship to that partnership that would overcome some of the difficulties that may come. So then I asked them, well, how, you know, how do you deal with jealousy? And for them, you know, jealousy was a tool to understand themselves. And, and it was an entrance point into understanding their own traumas and their own insecurities. And, you know, for example, like one person talked about how, uh, you know, what they noticed was that they were not always jealous. It was specific people who, when their partner was interested in them, they got jealous. And for them, what that highlighted was that, that for example, if their partner was interested in someone who had a personality type that they did not vibe with, that was the jealousy point. And so they made them think about, well, you know, why is it that maybe, for example, I'm triggered by people who are very affluent or, or something like that? So, so this was a way for them to locate their traumas their insecurities, see what it fed off of, and then take the fuel away from that and, and find peace and acknowledgement from that. Uh, and then again, they used tools that we talked about before, like what are their commitments? You know, do you still love me? Do we still want to be together? And, and that's what makes a relationship you know, really interesting and, 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 and strong. And, and then I asked the next question, which is that a lot of people in monogamous relationships said what made it special was that one-on-one -on -one interaction that they didn't have with anyone else. And so I asked them, like, well, what makes your relationship special? If you can go find anyone else, why be in this committed one-on-one -on -one relationship? And what they said is what makes their relationship unique and special 
are the collection of experiences and life events that they've been together um, that they can't be together with anyone else. I mean, those experiences are just specific to them. And they're creatively building something together, and that's also what makes it novel and special. So then, you know, another polyamorous uh, type that I talked to someone about was a throuple. And a throuple is a three-person uh, relationship. And it didn't work for this person, and they said that, you know, there are a lot of complexities with the throuple, because if the couple uh, in a throuple exists before, and then a third person sort of comes in, then this bond between the couple will be stronger, and so that creates um, sometimes an uneven relationship interaction. The next question I was really interested in was, how do you deal with heartbreak and rejection, attachment and looping thoughts? And these are questions that I've been thinking about way outside of my romantic journey because I'm really interested in how people deal with that because my thoughts often loop and I find that I'm very susceptible to that. So I've arranged this document where it goes from like early wound to then as time goes by, what are the other methods that you use to be able to heal? And the first general idea was that time itself heals. But, you know, the part of the insight that I liked a lot was what people said next, which was that even though time can heal, what it can also do is bury and hide and obscure the trauma. So, so it's not ever fully healed. It's sort of like this, this, this valley inside your subconscious. And then when you have new relationships, sometimes you, you walk on those landmines and you don't even realize that these are from things that you haven't processed from previous relationships. So while time can heal, people said that digesting that and ruminating on it can be a good thing. Now, right after the initial stages of heartbreak, a lot of people said that catharsis can help. And, and four people said that crying is really one of the best types of catharsis that they experience. Um, and again, this was in reference not only to heartbreak, but to really intense things like your parents passing away. One person said that, you know, he would try to bring himself to cry very deeply and dredge up those horrors. And, and as this really intense catharsis would happen, it would sort of lead him to laugh. And after going through a few cycles of these catharsis over, you know, the, the next several days or weeks, it would help reset him a little bit. After catharsis, a lot of people said distractions, especially in the early phases of, of the hurt, helps just distract the mind from being stuck in that, that, that you know, an endless cycle of, of loops. And so people said they kept busy, they read things, they hung out with friends and made new memories with them. You know, you could play with your dog, dance by yourself, be in nature. One interesting response was taking a bath. Because right after a relationship, you still sometimes have that sensory addiction of just being touched and you want to replace that. So what a bath allows you to do is you're, you're sort of engulfed in this warm water that's, that's, that's pressing on your skin. And in a way, it's, it's sort of helping you get over that sensory addiction. Another person said that like sometimes he puts a rubber band around his wrist for like just really intense loops that may be happening and every time the loop starts he just smacks his wrist. This is a shock to just snap him out of that loop. Some people said drugs and, and you know they said that it didn't help but that was something in the immediate that sort of dislodged their mind from from the loops and, and another person said that you have to be careful with alcohol and drugs because you can use it to escape but then they have their own vicious cycles. And another person said hooking up and, and hooking up really I guess helped him um, overcome the girlfriend that, 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 had, that the relationship had broken up with but again um, in the short term that helps but in the long term that usually is, is not a very good solution is what he said. And similarly another person said rebound relationships can help pick you up, but at the same time, it starts that relationship on the wrong foot and is often not the best solution. One person talked about how really the, the intense trauma of a relationship breaking apart um, and, and just being completely shattered and, and really what sustained her through was just the need, the survival instinct to take care of her kids. You know, four people talked about exercise and things like walking and, and the underlying idea that if you're not taking care of yourself, usually rejection can, and, and hurt can lay deeper roots into yourself. So self-care is very, very important. After those stages 
of, of the initial hurt. The next part is just digesting what has happened and, and trying to understand it. And a lot of people, they're, they process through talking. And so for them, talking to friends and a therapist can really help. Other people, the way they process is through writing. And so, you know, four people talked about writing and journaling. One person talked about making a list uh, because, again, like, you know, she said that in a relationship, you, you make these sensory connections, which are like a biological addiction. And your senses miss that contact and it's similar to withdrawal when you're getting off drugs and addiction. And so you have to reprogram your mind. So she makes two lists. The first is every time you think about him, you, uh, you look at the list and see, well, why is it that you decided to break up? And then the second list is what can you do when you're stuck in this loop of missing him uh, to take your mind off of it? Now, a few people talked about different types of meditation. One person talked about guided meditation through YouTube, where you focus on your breath and you do a body scan and that brings your mind into a more peaceful state when it's being ravaged by these hurricanes of thought. One person talked about sort of clearing her womb. Another person talked about yoga and, and vipassana as being methods that really helped her through, through difficult times. And the last sort of portion after you digest it is, is reframing your perspective. And the first sort of group of reframing our perspective was the idea that, look, this relationship just wasn't a good fit. And so in a way, it was good that it ended. And, you know, from the point of view of maybe you get a rejection when you're asking someone out or whatever, one person said that, you think about maybe that person was preoccupied or had many other things in, your, in their mind and it wasn't specifically you, but they're in their own sort of cycles and journey. Um, so that's sort of like reframing your perspective or your mind. Another, you know, three people said that if you experience a rejection or heartbreak, it doesn't mean that you by any means are a lesser person. It just means the circumstance was that you guys just couldn't balance with one another. And, and would you really want to be with someone that's not crazy about you? And another person sort of reiterated that's important to remember that just because a relationship ends doesn't mean it's a failure. You gathered things, you experienced things, uh, you know, you made destiny. And those are all valuable memories and, and learning experiences. And on the topic of learning, several people talked about taking heartbreak and rejection as being a place for self-growth. You know, the first idea is just accepting that Look, hurt and mental loops are always going to happen. They're ongoing and ever-present parts of life. So, so just accept that this, that this is happening as a natural process of life. And then see it as a learning experience. Again, insight about you. Well, what exactly did you need from the person that you're missing now? And, and can you self-generate some of that? It's also, someone said, a reminder for, to reflect and, and not be consumed by self-hatred and, and loathing. Uh, another person talked about the idea that, you know, after the breakup, when you're in that state of just like really intense hurt and, and you don't know what to do with that hurt energy, what he did is he dedicated all of his energy to the pursuit of a worthy goal. And, and by completely devoting himself to that worthy goal, it helped him wash away some of that pain. And then within the gratitude, you know, a few people said that, look, everything in life is impermanent. And... Focus on being grateful for the times, the good times that were there and, and, and that you enjoyed. Uh, and, and, and don't linger because it's inevitable for things to end. Now, the next question I had was, what are other relationships in your life that have been at the same level of a romantic relationship? And one person said that there was no comparison. And this, this was the person who believed or, or ha practices the 90-day cycle. And he said that when he is with a woman romantically, there are no, there's no more thinking. And she brings out all the masculinity. And he just stops thinking and acts. And it's primitive and it's damn satisfying. There's nothing that compares to that. Another person said pets. You know, for her, like her, the, you know, the emotional support that she got from, a, from her dog was more than that she got from most other people. You know, a bunch of people said close friendships were really at that same level. And three people said that these friendships were actually greater than their, their romantic relationships. And one quotation was that, you know, I love my friends deeper than I love my deep romantic partners. You know, I love my friends passionately. And sometimes when I think about how much I love my closest friends, I start crying a little bit. One person said family, one person said God. 
And the next thing I, you know, question-wise I had was like, like, what are other experiences that are at the same level of a good sexual experience um, or, or a romantic experience? And, you know, I don't, I don't want to gender generalize, but, you know, in general, what was interesting... So first of all, it was interesting that, you know, most people had experiences that, that rivaled the, the sexual experience. But interestingly, I found um, women would have a much more diverse set and, 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 a num and, and many more experiences that, that came at the level of a sexual experience than men, you know, who may just have one or two that, that sort of was there. Okay, so what are these experiences? So for some people, massages, like a good massage was equivalent to a good sexual experience, a perfect stretch when, when your muscle is wicked sore, uh, a really good foot rub, scuba diving or swimming in, in, in the ideal location. And another person talked about self-pleasure, which again is a sexual experience, but I think she was making a really good point, which was that sexual pleasure or self-pleasure is very important. Um, part of the process and, and can really enhance the sexual experience for both people. Um, okay, so then the next set of things that people said were at the level of like a really good sexual experience were a set of experiences that were sort of where you're immersed in a group. So for example, singing in a choir and you're, and you're, you're surrounded by this amazing enormous n noise or sound and it feels euphoric going to a really good concert, or actually being a, a performer in a concert and sharing this intense moment with a group of people. Uh, a dance experience, contact dancing, where it's not like explicitly necessarily erotic, but it is still very blissful. Laughing with friends, said someone, uh, like an uncontrollable release, and sharing silence with friends. One person had a really cool response, which for him it was like cycling. And he described two different types of cycling. One is just pace line, where I think you're just cycling, you know, just like a, like a single line, and then maybe the front guy comes to the back or, or person, and, and you do that. And he said that was really good, but it was not sex good. Um, but what was was something called a rotating pace line. And I'm not going to do a good job describing it, but from what I understood, it's like you have two rows, you know, two columns, whatever, right? They're, and they're, and they're in your you're bicycling very fast in, in these two very close together columns. And the, the, the right row or column is a little bit ahead, and then the person on the right then goes to the left and goes back a little bit. And so you're basically just rotating counterclockwise. And the reason why this was like a sexual experience is that um, you have to be in a complete focus and you have to be going really fast. And you have to have a certain baseline level of fitness and skill to be able to do this. And it's high velocity cycling together. So, you know, you have to be in the same wavelength, vibrating together. So it's a lot like sex. And you have to non-verbally communicate what's happening. So it's really intense. And he sort of went on to say that any sort of flow state, a, a task that requires a huge amount of skill that you've developed over time and demands concentration, but also is not at the point of like being too difficult. Those flow states can also have like a, a sexual like vibe or, or at the same level of that. Two people talked about food. So eating like a crisp apple, um, one person said was at, at the level of a very good sexual experience. Another person said like when you're really hungry and you're like so hungry that you don't even want sex at that point, it's like after you come back from a long hike, um, and, you're, and you're really hungry and you smell the smoke of barbecue and that's equal to the level of a good sexual experience. Some people talked about drugs. So for example, one person tried pot and for him, he, the first time he tried pot, he experienced a godlike experience um, and realized that the whole universe is an organism and we are one ocean of life and it felt way more beautiful than anything sexual. Uh, one person, you know, tried ecstasy and she, you know, I asked like, what exactly is your sensation? And she said that, you know, many people feel like expelling energy, for example, like during dancing. And during that, you have a, she had a great conversation with her friends. Um, and the major thing is it allows you to be vulnerable and, and things feel really nice to, to touch. Um, and, you know, when she was in it, it made her feel like everyone just wants to have a good time and there's no evil and everything seems okay, even if it's not. And after a very difficult breakup for her, um, you know, Rationally, you know, it was good to have that breakup, but then emotionally you didn't feel it. But with ecstasy, she sort of emotionally felt that breakup was beautiful, and she was proud of herself, and it was, it was a beautiful moment which rivaled an actual sexual experience. Another person said that, like, you know, something that rivals a good sexual experience is, is devoting yourself 
to a larger cause. That gives you a greater amount of satisfaction. So, so pursuit of a, of, of a great cause. A few people talked about meditation. So one person said for, for you know, them, good music. And so I just classified that as meditation. Another person said that uh, meditative bliss uh, makes you happy. And then sex makes you satisfied. Uh, and then, of course, if you're in love, then, then, then um, that enhances the, the, the satisfaction. It makes you actually feel happy, too. Um, this person, you know, was interesting. He can induce sort of like a state of trance in himself. And he does that by, by experiencing himself as being the universe itself, which I thought was really interesting. And he can actually, he was describing and switch himself from being his local identity, who he is in his body, to his global identity, which is the universe. Another person said that he actually feels orgasmic pleasure while, while meditating. And this was the person who does the 90-day serial monogamy cycles. So I asked him, well, if you feel orgasmic pleasure in meditation, why, why even be in a relationship or why have sex? And he said, without the experience of the woman, he would not be able to achieve the feeling through meditation. And the reason why, he said, is from his perspective, the universe is dualistic with male and female energies. And the goal of all human life is to experience that dualism. The movement from two to one, he said, is enlightenment. Um, so you have to merge the masculine and the feminine at the sixth chakra to get super consciousness. And the other, like, you know, things people said, like, you know, one person said good mental conversation is equal to a good sexual experience. And then the next one, uh, one person said playing Monopoly is, is good. So for me, Monopoly can be kind of excruciating. So it's kind of interesting, just like different people's perspectives. For one person, playing a fighting video game can be as good as a sexual experience or, or crying, um, you know, to themselves after coming to a beautiful realization. Now, the next question was a practical question, like, how do I start the dating process? Like, what, what are online dating sites that I can use? What's unique about it? In general, everyone said that, like, online dating is mad frustrating, and, and it's overwhelming, and it's time-consuming, and eats up a lot of effort. There's a lot of anonymity in online dating, and so people are just less caring, and there's a lot of ghosting going on, which is where they have interaction with you, for a little bit, you think maybe it's going well, and then they just completely drop off and never never answer you again. And, and maybe you're left feeling kind of sad that there's no closure. Uh, there are also a lot of fragmented conversations. So you may be talking to five or six people on online dating, and it's fragmented across a lot of time. Because like you may talk to someone in the morning, and then you may reply at the end of night. And so it's it's that's kind of like the continuity of like a good conversation is not always there. And then you have to go through thousands of, of profiles. So one of the most famous ones is Tinder. And, you know, people said that everyone is on Tinder. Uh, so, so that's one reason for doing it. One couple matched through Tinder and, and eventually they got married. And they also said that they knew friends that, that met through Tinder as well. And so for them, they found Tinder to be a little bit more genuine and honest because there wasn't as much information that you could put there. Uh, it was just like a picture and maybe like a handful of words. Uh, whereas for them, OkCupid and things like that gave you the ability to be very verbose and then you just get overwhelmed with even more information and what do you do with it? One person paid Tinder to get, to, uh, to get a sing signal boost uh, because he doesn't have like a lot of time and so he really wanted to be efficient about it. And so he ended up only spending about an hour a week finding people on Tinder and then an hour a week dating someone. Um, and then another person said that, like, of course, like, there's a lot of negatives to Tinder. It's superficial and, like, it's very appearance-based and many of those different aspects. And another one of the negatives was that Tinder works if you're able to pitch yourself as being very universal. And that Tinder typically does not work for neurotypical, uh, sorry, does not usually work for non-neurotypical people. Um, and it also, for that reason, doesn't work for people who may have criminal backgrounds. And the next one is Bumble, which is very similar to Tinder, where you're like swiping and, and, and looking at pictures and stuff. Uh, the difference is now that the, that the female can be the initiator. And so one person said that because of that, it's feminist forward and female empowering. One person found it to be a little bit more serious than Tinder. Hinge, uh, the, the idea there is that you have, I guess, some prompts. And, and then you sort of respond to those problems. I haven't actually tried any of these. 
So I, you know, I, I don't know how many, what's true and what's not, but you respond to these prompts and, and then that sort of adds a little bit more personality to Tinder. Um, and some people found that to be, or one person found it to be more s serious than Tinder. Then there's coffee meets bagel and offers fewer number, people said, um, or one person said, fewer number of potential like partners or whatever uh, options. And, and so then that makes it a little bit less overwhelming than Tinder or Bumble. Then there's Facebook dating. And one person said that, you know, from his analysis, most apps algorithms work on cycles. So they artificially bring down the number of matches. And this is to sort of encourage you to pay for their subscription. Um, but he has found in his experience that as of now, Facebook dating doesn't seem to do that as much. Then there's Match.com, and for one person that really worked well, and he said that you know in Match.com they're looking for more serious relationships, long-term relationships, and and relationships where maybe you want children. As you know, several people tried OkCupid, and they said that it's friendly to non-monogamous people, and and you can have like options, I guess, where you can select that you can have many partners. Um, and sometimes they said the flow, in contrast to some of the other apps, is that you can think and compose long emails back and forth. And one person, you know, found that it, it was a good, did a good job at predicting who could be friends. Um, there's another one called Birdie, where it's personality driven, but you have to take a personality test. Uh, there's one called Field, where it's, it's dating for non-monogamous people, and it's a way to find unicorns. And I learned that a unicorn is a person who will join a couple for a threesome. And so this is usually a fairly, you know, straight couple looking for a threesome. Okay, so the next question I had was just like on online dating and like what, what kind of profiles and, and, and all of that information. So for profile pictures, the suggestions I was given, uh, and these were, you know, all by women, was that pictures should not have a gun, bloody dead animals, uh, should ideally not have statements like women's place is in the kitchen, um, should, you should not be holding a fish that blocks your face, shirtless bathroom selfies, and excessive group pictures. Another person said, basically you want to convey that you're not an axe murderer, because this is like a serious problem, that there is a lot of violence in, in dating for women, and so conveying that you're not a violent person is actually very important. It's kind of sad, but it, it is a reality. Um, another person said, good pictures include clear face and eyes, sometimes having one picture with an animal or child, can help one picture with people. Uh, another person said, good spelling, no dead fish, no Snapchat filters, no group pictures, have words, give something to comment on, and, and current shows and books. And then I sort of asked, like, you know, what kind of words or things should I put in my profile? And so these are people who, who kind of know me, and they're like, these, this is what you should write on your dating profile. So one person said that I should write that I'm new to the scene and still trying to learn, and, and she said that would filter out many people who otherwise would not be interested. One person said just be short, terse, and succinct with your messages. One person for Match.com gave me a whole bunch of different things. I'll just read a few of these. The rest is on my website if you want to check it out. Um, you know, things like you, you can use code words, and there are a lot of code words. So, for example, if I say I'm looking for someone financially secure, that means someone who has, you know, money and, and maybe is not in debt and things like that. Um, you know, he recommended that I use interesting photos but not challenging ones because, like, you know, I have pictures of myself doing a nasty pose. And, you know, he said that pictures of, of me with a cactus coming out between my legs is maybe not the best image to use um, because I do have several of those pictures. Uh, and then, you know, a bunch of, bunch of other good suggestions. I'm a creative person or an artistic person. Um, so, yeah. He also said that I should, I should uh, curate my, my internet presence um, because, again, like, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, I don't know, crazy stuff on there uh, because my artwork is, is, uh, pushes, pushes buttons, maybe. I don't think so. I don't know. Um, so then there are actions that people had suggested. So for Tinder, people said that, you know, or for any of those dating apps, start off with an easy, relaxed, fun question, like, I like your hair. And then from there, try to set a date or time to meet. Um, one person said, try creating a female doppelganger just to get a feeling of like, what does the female experience? What's the other side like? Another person said, don't be too forward and don't respond immediately. There's, there needs to be a delay, I guess, several hours between these texts so you don't seem needy which which is what the the one below says attachment and need in his words lead to a dry pussy 
Now, you know, other people said that I you know, show my commencement speech, my research, and consider curating my website and YouTube because it could scare away people. Um, then I asked, well, you know, like, what are non-online ways of dating? Uh, one person said the universe just sort of brings, brings him potential partners. Other people said go to art events, you know, different local events, um, like Eye Opener in Somerville. Uh, three people said I should broadcast to my entire friend group and ask them to set me up. Um, social dancing, different interest groups, volunteer clubs, open mics, poly speed dating, intramural, you know, single sports, ask a matchmaker. Uh, one person said, you know, convert your friends into lovers and, um, you know, things like that. And the other question, just like, you know, like what is flirting about and, and what's, what is all that like initial like dating like vibes like? What, what is all that about? And it, different people had different responses. So, for example, like, well, what is flirting? Well, just show that you're interested and, and get them to giggle. Uh, make eye contact and, and facial like uh, facial stuff like like eyebrows um, you know give more explicit compliments and say things like that's so cute uh, it was just kind of interesting too because like you know as I was talking to people I thought like flirting was like this whole different domain of communication but they were like some people even said that I was what I was doing was an example of flirting because when we started the interviews like usually what I do is if I see someone's wearing cool clothes then I always compliment clothes or if someone's background is looking really cool I'll always compliment that so I was confused I was like well my natural tendency is to compliment so how is this different than flirting and, and I guess the main idea I, I understood is very context dependent um, so if you're flirting in a contextual situation that would be a romantic situation then a simple compliment is, is flirting Whereas if you're just outside and you're chilling and you're meeting someone and, and you compliment them, it may not be. Uh, that was, I think that was like the main takeaway that I got. And then another person, uh, she said that there, she really broke it down. She said there are two different types of flirting. One's called just for fun flirting. And this is like flirting that's not meant to go anywhere. You're like on the bus or the grocery store and you just sort of wink or smile or make eye contact and, and try to make you know, someone laugh and it's, it's, and it's just fun. And then the other one, she said, is like more serious flirting. And again, she says she found it that's not too different from normal conversation. It's just if you find yourself really enjoying the conversation with someone you're attracted to, that may be considered flirting. And she said there are things like eye contact and blushing and smiling and looking a bit embarrassed, but try not to focus on that. And then, and then she sort of said the reason why is because it will distract you and you won't be immersed in the moment. And, and you know, she went on to say that if you... Her advice is that if you enjoy a conversation with someone enough to want to talk to them again, just be honest and say, you know, I, I enjoyed the conversation and if you're interested, let's talk again. And that can be very scary to do, like try to get a number and stuff like that. Yeah, the other question I sort of had is like, you know, how, how, do you, how do I know if someone likes me romantically? And again, I think at the end of the day what, what people gravitated towards is at, at my like sort of stage and age, um, it's just the best, just, just ask, just be explicitly clear and communicate. Um, that's probably the best way to do it. Um, although, you know, that, that's, a, that's a scary option, I guess, just like blindly asking. So the, the final set of things are just like sort of miscellaneous things that people gave me as, as like gems of advice. So in terms of action, one advice someone did, gave me is like for a first date, Choose like, a, like an activity that the other person can end quickly if they're not into you. So like getting coffee, that's low commitment. It's a, it, it could be something that's 15 minutes long or 30 minutes long, sort of like just based on interest. But they also said that come, you know, brainstorm a few scale up options. If, if you guys are really getting along well, then go for lunch or dinner or some other option, nearby park, um, things like that. They also said like pick ideas dating ideas that give you a lot of space to talk, like eating because you have to wait for the food gives you an opportunity to get to know one another. You know, three people said that just be very, you know, out loud and clear um, what you're feeling internally. Clear communication is, is important. Another person gave valuable insight, which is that find out what each person's no sounds like, because some people may not explicitly say no, but their body language 
or a subtle way of communicating really is expressing that they're saying no. So getting that is important to do because everyone responds and expresses differently. On the topic of accepting and giving rejections, they said that you know if you're not into someone, don't be nice. Like be honest, and the quicker you finish it, the better, so that people don't sort of develop uh, you know bonds and 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 you don't linger on um, for longer. Uh, one person, you know, she was giving me advice, was saying that, you know, trying to encourage me that don't be afraid to just, like, ask someone. Um, she said, like, she particularly has never been offended if someone's expressed sexual or romantic interest in her. The only thing that she's, you know, been offended by or not liked is that after she politely says no, then not listening to that low. So the message she was giving here is that there's nothing wrong to being interested in someone and expressing it bluntly. Um, it's just the aftermath. If someone says no, then, then of course go away. And the second sort of thing that a piece of advice she gave me is that, you know, a lot of a lot of women may respond um, to a man's adva advances very harshly. And she said, you know, there's a reason for this because there are many men out there who don't accept polite no's and as a result sort of they have to have this defensive armor to just like really strongly communicate, I'm not interested. Um, and so her message she's trying to say is that even if someone's harsh, it has nothing to do with me. Um, it's, it's just the unfortunate and inevitable consequence of many relentless men um, that are out there. Another person told me, you know, as a relationship deepens, one good thing to start developing are code words for identifying particular loops and, and triggers because that helps um, overcome intense emotions and, and some of those landmines. That, that may have been implanted from previous relationships. Another really valuable insight was that, you know, both sides, you know, man and female, uh, experience sex differently. And so, sort of like the idea in the culture that penis and vagina sex is like the culminative um, experience is, is not shared. You know, maybe some women out there really don't enjoy or, or find um, vaginal penetration to, to be exciting or, or that great. And so, so thinking about that and communicating and talking to your partners is really important. And um, the other sort of interesting uh, point was that, you know, so I was sharing that you know, I'm 39 years old and it's like, I have no experience with absolutely anything. So it's kind of scary because like everyone around me probably has equal, has a lot of experience and, and, and it's a unique situation to be in. And this person said that actually there is a population of people who, feel similar things to me and that's the population of people who've been incarcerated for a long time because you know just like me they, they don't have cell phones they don't know anything about modern dating uh, they really haven't done anything romantic in a very very long time and they have very similar questions um, I guess as I do another you know two people gave me resources one person told me to watch Love on the Spectrum which is autistic people who are um, I guess going on the path of romance and they're asking similar questions and 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 you know they found that the questions or answers that are being given were really good uh, when I attended the relationship or anarchy support group they gave this as a, as a potential source um, I think OMG yes uh, is, a, is a website if I remember correctly it's like a paid thing and it, there, it, it sounded kind of cool, like, for example, one of the exercises they give you in this is they, there's like a little vagina and, and then you sort of like learn how to stimulate it um, appropriately. And then, and then I forget what Scarlet Teen was about, but that was suggested to me. And then Pornhub, I guess, has like a sexual education portion um, of his website, which I didn't know about either. Another person said that as a relationship gets deeper, when you start looking at long-term relationships, finance can be important. And so that's something to think about. Um, one vocab word another person shared was, was limerence, which I had not heard before. And it's a state of mind which results from a romantic attraction to another person, and it typically includes obsessive thoughts and fantasies um, and a desire to form or maintain a relationship with the object of love and have one's feelings reciprocated. So that was a cool vocab word. You know, another person uh, talked about the idea that, you know, there, for people who say that all, all there is to a relationship is love, you know, she sort of challenged that and said, no, there are more things to think about, such as justice and kindness, um, hunger and thirst for knowledge and learning, the idea of exploring and investigating things together, and, and nature and, and, and unity. Um, and, and, you know, our, the parting thought was that the relationship should add to your humanity. And if it's not adding to your 
humanity, then, then think about what that relationship is. So that finishes the, the wisdom that I have gained from all of my romantic informational interviews. Uh, thanks to everyone who took the time out and, and gave me all of this wisdom.